So it is my great pleasure to kick off this year's conference with an amazing young man. I'm, I'm constantly happily surprised by some of the young people who are uh, really leaders in this community. Uh, we have an incredible young man, Armin Navabi, uh, from Iran, um, who started Atheist Republic. And if you don't know about it, go check it out. It has a massive following worldwide. It's doing great work. Uh, he's written a book. I believe his, yeah, his book, is, book is at the back table. Please pick up a copy. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Armin Navabi. I'm Armin from Atheist Republic, and I'm here to talk to you about how atheists can do a better job at reaching out. I better stay here. <laughs> I was going to walk around, but apparently I can't. To ex-Muslims, well. So as most people know, it's not really safe for ex-Muslims to talk about their views in Muslim countries, in Muslim majority countries. Um, in 20 countries, at least 20 countries, it's still considered a crime to just leave Islam, let alone criticize Islam. But in some other safer countries, like Turkey, where people feel safe to be open about their secular or atheist values, you can see a lot of atheist and secular activism. And even in countries where it's less safe, um, for do those of us who are very active with the atheist community on social media, we can see that there's a great demand for it, at least privately, for atheist and secular activism in countries like uh, Iran, Pakistan, and even in Saudi Arabia, um, people are very careful, but you can see there's a lot of fake accounts, private accounts, people are trying to just express their frustration. Um, so there is demand for it. A lot of people don't think that these countries are way too religious to have a, a large atheist community, but they're there. It's not that these It's not that atheist activism in these countries are anything new. The, the, you know, secularism and atheism is not new concepts in these countries. They, they have been there for hundreds of years. They have been discussing these things for uh, their philosophers. Or, um, it's just that it's been driven underground, so it's harder for us to see. There's a lot of examples you know, when it, in, in places where it's a little bit safer there's a lot of examples of uh, people trying to fight the religion dominating their lives. This is in Turkey. This is some young people responding uh, to the government trying to ban alcohol. <laughs> this is in Iran. These are some brave girls that decided to take off their hijab right in front of a government sign reminding them how important hijab is. This is a really risky thing to do, especially you can see here that you could get arrested for just bad hijab, let alone no hijab. This is a police officer on the right arresting this girl for showing some hair. I was arrested in Iran once, and based on my experience and based on the look on her face, I could tell like she's really worried about how this could turn out, turn out. It's not always clear what's gonna to happen to you when, um, when you get arrested. It's really scary. This is, um, this is one of the many pictures from a very popular Facebook page dedicated to women that send their pictures, their hijabless pictures for the page to post. Um, this is their small way of showing their defiance to you know, them thinking that their government is violating their freedom. This is, you know, this is the most visible way of showing it. And there's, 
you know, when, when governments limit your freedom, they limit it in many different ways. But um, sometimes taking off the hijab is the most obvious way to show that you're still fighting. For us, it means, might seem not, not that big of a deal, but um, I mean, it's just a hijab, like it's just a head covering. But for a lot of people, it signifies much more. Um, this is basically one way of showing that you're, you're not giving up. You're still, you're still fighting. You know, the consequences for speaking out could be very high. These are some of the many people that have paid for the, their decision to speak out um, with their freedom, with their safety, with their lives. And I'm sure most of you can recognize at least one face here. So given that we live in a place where we can say anything without the fear of somebody coming and you know, prosecuting us or just having a certain idea, I think it's our, we owe it to our fellow atheists in Muslim countries to lend our voice to people that don't have a voice or to people that pay such a high price for their voice. This is me kissing the Quran before going to school. That's my mom. Um, my parents weren't very religious, but this was a thing to do. Even though my parents weren't very religious, when I grew older, I became very religious. This is the Islamic look in Iran. Yeah. This is, this is how the cool kids in school know that they need to stay away from you. <laughs> when, I, when I became very religious, I started studying religion much more closely. And that had the effect of turning me into an atheist. <laughs> and being an atheist in Iran at that time felt very, very lonely and isolating. Now it's much easier with social media, it's easy to find other atheists there, but at that time I, was, I felt like, why is nobody else seeing this? Like, it's so obvious, I, was, I felt I was going crazy. And I started this um, online community for, called Iranian Atheists on the site called Orkut. It was pre-Facebook era. But um, I didn't think much of it, but I just opened it and left it there. And within weeks, so many people Iranian atheists joining it. And I was surprised, they were surprised. They were like, oh my God, Iranian atheists. Like, these are atheists and they're in Iran. We couldn't believe that we are there and there's so many of us. It was like, it was so emotionally, emotionally rewarding. And for us, it felt like we found like this hidden secret family that we didn't know we have. And to me, it seemed like this must be true for many other places. So this led to uh, me starting a community called Atheist Republic. And the idea behind that was um, anybody that feels that they're being demonized for their atheism anywhere in the world, they should be able to find uh, an outlet, their own community, their own atheist community that they feel welcomed in. And even to this day, we still get people from all around the world when they join we still get messages like, oh, I didn't know there's so many of you out there. Like, not just from Islamic countries, like from Philippines, from Mexico, from Brazil, they join and they, for example, somebody posts a comment and says like, are there any Filipino atheists here? And then they get 50 comments. And I'm like, holy crap, there's so many Filipino atheists here. And they get so, for them, that's so emotionally rewarding. And for them, they feel less, weird that they're atheists, they're less, less ashamed, less alone. This is um, Mohammed Sayed, one of the founders of Ex-Muslims of North America. And he interviews a lot of ex-Muslims in United States and Canada. And he mentioned to me that the most persistent line that he gets in his interviews from ex-Muslims is, I didn't know, I, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know there's so many other ex-Muslims out there. 
And he interviews ex-Muslims in United States and Canada. So if they feel like that, imagine what ex-Muslims in Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they must, uh, they must feel really alone. They must not, it, you know, it's, it's strange because we still have social media, but so it must be easier for them to connect, but there's so much noise out there. There's so much, the, you know, Muslims are also on social media and they're doing a much better job at spreading their message than we are right now. So why does this matter? Why should we uh, reach out to ex-Muslims? <laughs> so secular activists, secular and atheist activists in Western countries in the past few decades have done a very good job at fighting for gay rights, women rights, transgender rights. Uh, protecting people from religious di discrimination, and more and more people are sharing these ideas, and it's become like norm. Um, we have done, we have become much more efficient. We have made a lot of progress. There's still so much to be done, but we, you know, the the platform and the audience that we have is much larger than a lot of atheist activists in Muslim countries, and even without the network that we have here, without the platforms that we have here. The atheist activists over there, they have done so much. So imagine if they had, if we uh, gave them the same resources and the same platform and same global audience that we have. So this is, this is actually very easy to do. As I mentioned, we, ha we are here, uh, we are free to say whatever we want. So why not lend them our freedom of expression. Why not share our platform, our audience with them? If you, if you have a YouTube channel or a podcast, why not invite an ex-Muslim on your show? If you have a blog or a popular website, why not let them guest blog on your, on your website or at least write an article about one of their stories? They, they you know, I feel like um, right, right now, the atheist movement and the secular movement, they're very excited about the Islamic reform movement. Um, but I feel, I feel, I see a lot more momentum in the ex-Muslim atheist mo movement in the Islamic countries, and I feel like that's not getting the same amount of attention as the reform movement, the attention that it deserves. Another reason why it's good to reach out to ex-Muslims is that it provides a channel for us to reach out to Muslims that are feeling a little bit skeptical about their religion, they have questions, they have doubts. Um, you know, if when, when they hear Westerners criticize Islam, for them, it might seem like another Western ideology try, trying to hijack another reform movement. But when they also see them side by side, uh, ex-Muslims that come from their own cultural background, from their own environment, they might, um, it might have a much more powerful impact. But as I mentioned, right now, um, you know, M Muslim organizations, Islamic organizations, they, they, they see the power of social media and they, ha they, they are very heavily funded um, and they are doing a much better job on social media. So we need to step up and we need to try to reach out to more people. So when I tell this to people, I hear some common concerns people have about talking about anything Islam related. So these are some of the points that they bring up. A lot of people mention that they wanna focus on local issues because they think that's where you could have the highest impact and this used to be true, but in, you know, with social media, I think this is becoming much less relevant. Right now, more, as we speak, more ideas are being changed um, online as a, at, you know, at a much more rapid pace than they are being offline. Some people say, you know, even if we could do something, you know, this is, um, coming from leaders of atheist or secular organizations, they like, our members, they care more about local issues. So we should 
focus on issues that our members care about. But usually I ask them, well, have you communicated this with your members? Maybe if you could more effectively show them what a powerful impact they could have, which I will discuss what, what we could do, but if you could show them that they could have a, a powerful impact, they might be more, much more um, interested in participating. In fact, this could be, discussing this with your members could be, a, interest, might excite them about your next project. This, this could be, um, you know, you never know unless you discuss it. This is the main one though. Um, most people say that they don't want to talk about something they don't understand. And they're afraid of people taking it the wrong way. They're afraid of looking like a bigot. Um, they say, I'm an ex-Christian. I understand Christianity. I don't understand Islam. Let someone else talk about it. They say, you know, it seems like Muslims have so many different views, and when I criticize Islam, I don't even know if this is actually Islam, because every two Muslims I talk to, is someone says, this is Islam, this is not Islam, so how could I even criticize something if I don't even know if this is the ideology or not? They say, you know, okay, Islamic dogma might be harmful, but Islam, uh, the Islamic culture is harmless, it's beautiful, it's inspiring, and I don't want to seem like I'm attacking people's cultural identity when I'm criticizing Islam. And usually the lines between culture and religion seem so unclear, so I don't know where to draw the line. But this is exactly why it's a great idea to have ex-Muslims involved. Um, you know, these are people that come from the same cultural background, most of them, the same um, ethnic background. So by having them involved, uh, you're separating the dogma from the culture. And, there, and you know, the uh, race and culture become a separate issue because you're not targeting people's culture and race because uh, you're, you're coming from a position of people with the background and the experience and the knowledge that share the same um, culture. And also, by talking to them, you can feel more comfortable about knowing exactly how people's personal lives are being influenced by, um, this, by this religion. So what can we do? Here are like three or four ways that I think is the best way. So if you don't know where to start, one way is to reach out to some organizations that are, do this all the time. And one of them is ex-Muslims of North America. They, these are Sarah and Muhammad. These are the uh, uh, founders of the organizations. And this, they have great resources. So if your organization doesn't know where to start, a good place to start is just to basically start, uh, contact them and um, you know, talk about them, their experiences or have them on your show or invite them to your events. Uh, or just get to know ex-Muslims and uh, again, get them to share their stories um, on your platform. That's, as we discussed, that's a really powerful way. Um, or talk, you know, the last two options were to, to how to reach to ex-Muslims that are already here. But you could also reach out to um, atheist groups specifically for each country. And you know, these countries, you know, when people talk about Islamic countries, they treat them as if oh, they're all the same, but they're very different and each one of them has very unique issues. And getting to know them separately and talking to the leaders of these organizations separately might be a good way of, you know, if you have a good understanding of um, the differences and talk to these people from a position of knowledge, they feel um, more understood and um, they'd be more encouraged on working with you. So what we do, um, the most, I think the most powerful way to have an impact is to um, share people's personal stories. And, you know, stories have 
a very, you know, when, you, when people share their personal stories, it's the best way to get others to care about them. You know, you could share data and reports and research and, you know, this many people get influenced by this as much as it's important. But when you, when somebody reads about uh, people's personal stories, that that's, has a much more powerful impact in, trans, in transcending culture and geography because um, it's easier to start relating to other people. Um, so what we try to do, oh, and another in, a great way actually to, that we think uh, to share per people's stories is not just um, on blogs is to is for people to send their to send us their audio message or even pictures. Pictures are a great way to um, send messages, like this one, for example. This is a picture that was sent to us by. Uh, <laughs> this is this is in Kaaba. This is the heart of Islam. This is the holiest place for Muslims. She. This is a Arab girl. Uh, that sent this to us. She told us she was really scared when she was taking this picture, um, and uh, she's a Syrian. She, she's a Syrian girl. She was living uh, in Saudi Arabia at the time, um, and when we asked her permission to share this, and when we shared this, it, it went viral. Um, usually, go, these things go viral because we get a lot of hate from Muslims, but they, I don't know. It, it always backfires. It always gets much more attention when they when they start attacking us. But <laughs> but it we we got a lot of hate. It was I don't know how this is offensive. I mean it's just it's I mean, it's just a picture. It doesn't say it has no message or anything. It's just a, it's just hair way of showing hair solidarity with the global atheist community. Uh, but we didn't just get hate messages. We got a lot of messages from other ex-Muslims from all around the world showing her that hang in there, I don't know, you go girl, and like all these kind of, you know, support. And it was, it was great. And she read them and she was very, you know, for us it might seem, you know, not that big of a deal. But for, when you feel so alone and you have nobody to talk to about any of these frustrations, when you see hundreds of people all of a sudden showing their support, it's just, it, it just really helps you feel less alone. Even, though if, even if nobody knows your real name, knows what you look like, they just, you know that it's directed at you. And it's, just, it's very powerful. By the way, um, the, the girl that sent us this picture is right now a refugee in Turkey. So if anybody has any, ex we have been trying to get her out of there and it has been much more difficult than what we thought it would be. So if anybody has any experience with this, please let us know. This was sent to us from Algeria. Uh, this was sent to us from Marwan in Morocco. This was from Jesse in Lebanon. And you can see in Lebanon it's safer to be an atheist because she feels free to show her face. And actually, you know, when people say show their faces or not, it's very has been very consistent uh, with what we expect based on the countries that they send it from. Um, this is from Farooq in Pakistan, and you can see that he didn't even feel safe to show his hand in Pakistan. Which is This is from Tunisia. Um, you know, when we get a lot of these pictures sent to us, and I think the main reason why people send these, send these pictures to us is they want to read the comments after we post them, because they, they like to see the comments after we post them, and they feel like uh, less alone. Um, and for it has another effect as well. A lot of other ex-Muslims, you know, we get messages from people that say like, oh, we, we come to your website, we come to your Facebook page, but we don't even like your page. We don't want our friends to see that we liked your page, but we just visit it often. But when they see these pictures, they see like there's other ex-Muslims around them that actually t wrote this, like just writing these on a paper, you know, I w in Iran, I would feel like I'm committing blasphemy, like it's 
for them to see this is like very encouraging. They're like, wow, there's people actually sending, um, are proud of their lack of belief. And for them, they, you know, it's kind of like how the uh, gay community in North America was very successful in, make, in making fe people feel less alone, less ashamed uh, about who they are in North America in the past few decades. I think like we're trying to do the same thing with atheists. So that was through pictures. Another way we try to get people to share their stories is um, for them to send us their audio message. And this is, this is the stuff that we're doing and I'm just sharing it so that if you have your own platform or your own website, these are ideas you could work with. One thing we are doing on our website is that we uh, put this green button on almost every page on our website and from anywhere you're in the world, from Mexico, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Ir Iran, you could just click on this button and you could record your voice and you don't have to leave your name and you could share your story. And we are going to start an Atheist Republic podcast. We're just waiting to have enough voicemail before we get started. And we just, the podcast is just going to be just people's voicemails, just their stories, their personal experiences from all around the world. And also, if, if you are not one of those atheists that feels isolated or alone, you could leave a message. You could go to atheistrepublic.com and you could tell them to hang in there, that you're, you know, that we're there for them, um, that they're not alone. And, you know, it, it makes a big difference. And um, it's a starting point. It might not change the world today, but if we could bring people closer together, I think, and if we could get people to start caring uh, for, for, these, uh, for our fellow atheists in other countries, I think eventually, this increased amount of caring will make people fight for them more often and speak out for them more often and feel less, um, less afraid of speaking about issues that need to be spoken about. So that's me. If you have any ideas or suggestions or your own strategies, please email me. Um, or if you want to collaborate in anything, um, um, we have a large community at Atheist Republic. We have more than a million followers worldwide, mostly from very religious countries. Um, so yeah, if you if any if there's any way we could help you, um, let me know. That's it. Anyone want to stick around? If anybody wants, there's the, uh, the mic for the audience right here. If anybody wants to come up and ask a question, the hardest is to be the first person to ask a question. Can you uh, come to the mic if you want to ask a question? Um, what's that? Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to thank Armin. Uh, what he's doing in the stories that he's able to tell through Atheist Republic is the reason that I have this conference. It's the reason I think this is important enough to dedicate, I don't know how many hours to organizing something like this, and it is uh, terribly wonderful to, to look out and... Oh, you back? Good, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Divine intervention. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it's wonderful to look out in the audience and see basically 300 secular atheist skeptics, humanists, however you identify, or if you don't use any of those labels that you just um, feel that this is important. I feel that this is important enough that I wanted to put on a conference. I hope you feel it's important enough that you are willing to do your own bit in supporting this community one way or the other.
Yeah, I can do that. Um, yes, I'm also interested in your logo, but also I am sure other people would like to hear your story about your journey and what brought you here to North America. Okay. Um, well, the, at Atheist Republic, we do everything based on what the community demands. So it's a republic. So we asked what um, what we're supposed to, what they want us to represent, and um, the most consistent things that we got was um, unity, logic, freedom of expression, freedom from oppression. So strength and logic were uh, sorry. Um, Strength and freedom were the two um, main elements that came up all the time. So we looked for symbols. So the horse usually in, in crests represents freedom. So that's supposed to represent the freedom from freedom of expression and freedom from oppression. And the lion is supposed to represent usually in crests they represent uh, strength. So that's um, strength of logic and um, strength from unity. And the ring is actually the most old school atheist logo uh, that it was. This is, a lot of people don't recognize it, but the people that were involved in the atheist uh, community um, long before, they, they just the ring, the simple zero is supposed to be like, no, nothing is supposed to represent like atheism. But that's, that's what we put there. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, my own story. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, so I mentioned I, that that I. All right. So when I was when I was younger, I was always terrified about going to hell, and I was also very terrified about my parents going to hell. So, you know, in Iran, before they tell us, and this is a little bit different for, among other Muslims, but uh, what they tell us is that boys before age 15, they commit no sin. They have committed no sin. So it's not like Christianity when you're born with original sin. Muslims think that's ridiculous. They think babies are, they have, you know, they're pure. And for girls, it's nine. For boys, it's 15. <laughs> <laughs> So that means anything I do before age 15 does not count as a sin. Um, and if you die before, the age 15, before age 15, you go to heaven. Um, so I thought about this, and I was terrified about going to hell. And I was like, suicide is a sin in Islam, but not if you do it before age 15. <laughs> So, and you know, I, I wasn't depressed or anything. I just really wanted to avoid going to hell. So I jumped out of my high school window. <laughs> um, I, I was in a wheelchair for seven months. I didn't die. <laughs> um, so, and the only reason why I didn't try, because I really believed that, I, you know, why wouldn't I, I was, why didn't, why is nobody else doing this? It seemed like an obvious <laughs> choice. Like, this is a loophole in the system. <laughs> I'm playing a game that nobody asked me if I want to play, and the punishments if I lose is eternal torture. I could just quit early. <laughs> and make sure that I go to heaven. And the only reason why I didn't try again was because I saw my, you know, I saw my father cry for the first time. That was a shock. I saw my mom collapse on, on the ground in the hospital. I was like, okay, I shouldn't do this to them. Um, so I didn't try again. But when I reached age 15, I was like, I have to play this game now. I have to make sure that I don't miss a prayer. I have to make sure I fast. I make sure I do everything right. And I make sure I understand Islam very clearly, because that's what you're supposed to do, and that's eventually what brought me to atheism, because the more I studied it, the less it made sense. <laughs> um, and oh, what brought me here was, um, I, 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 I just, um, when I got into Tehran University, and after a while I decided that I want to try another university, so I applied for a student visa and went to UBC in Vancouver, so that's, 
that's why I went. Yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. My name is Ahmed Shams. Um, I'm also a former Muslim, and uh, like you, I also went through the issues with my parents. Now, my parents are really good, but for the most of my friends, they aren't. Um, and I'd just like to know if you have any opinion for me to give to them on how to deal with their still Muslim parents. Um, well, it's, it's very different from family to family. Um, and I think, you know, the most, imp you know, the most important thing for them, you know, I could, I could relate to them because sometimes it really depends, right? But for them, they must feel that they're not losing you, you know? It's more important than making them not Muslim, right? They, they're genuinely concerned that you're sometimes, I don't know if this is true with you, but sometimes they're genuinely uh, concerned that, um, you know, you're losing your way and sometimes they feel like you're gonna go to hell. Um, I mean, some parents are more accepting than the others, but I think more than, you know, a lot of, of ex-Muslims I've seen, they try to argue their way out of this and more often than not, that didn't work. I mean, it worked for me, my parents, Eventually, both of them became atheists, but <laughs> <laughs> but what I've seen work for most other ex-Muslims is just to be loving and caring and showing to them that you're still their baby boy, you're still their baby girl, and you still love them no matter what. And eventually, they just get used to it. I, I, that's what I. But I think like this is. I think the best thing to do is just to join ex-Muslim uh, communities. Um, like ex-Muslims of North America, and because the stories are, because this, each family has their own very specific situation, is to share the details, and there's a, you will find a lot of ex-Muslims that have similar experiences with you, and I think that's a bit, that's the power, that's a good thing about creating communities like this. So talking to other people with the similar experiences and sharing them, and just even if you don't get any advice, just sharing it with other people sometimes could feel really good. Hi there. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation as well, but one of the things that I kind of rolled in my head, because I saw the Iranian agnostic, uh, atheist agnostic movement, and I, I enjoy that page as well, and uh, one of the things they said was that because of Facebook's social standards and a lot of complaints about certain postings, that a lot of the you know, freedom of speech is now being curtailed because of people's offense. Huh. Um, and, and how do you deal with that kind of thing where you know, you're going to be in the social media spotlight, whether it's through Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and people take offense to virtually you know, yeah, my, anything you have to say? Yeah, my account has been blocked so many times for report, mass, like they know how to mass report your post, posts that are like even Muslims will consider non-offensive. But they just don't care. They just like mass report this, so this I can't get blocked by Facebook. The thing is that it's not really against freedom of speech because you know Facebook is not the government. So I mean, it's a private company; they could do whatever they want. If if it's not if it's if it's not the, against if your government is not silencing you, that's really not violating anyone's freedom of speech. It's just that it's we just try to what we're trying to do with Facebook is try to file so many complaints so that it becomes in their best interest to start paying attention to their reporting methods because there's not that many humans looking at this, it's all just you know, algorithms. And we think if somebody actually looked at all these reports, we could see that most of them are not violating any community standards. So we're just trying to, we're actually trying to mobilize a lot of people to keep on pressuring Facebook to get more humans involved in reviewing the reports. Yes, I'd like to thank you for your presentation for starts. <clears throat> um, myself, personally, I have suffered with depression probably since around 10, 11 years old, finally diagnosed at 40. Uh, a couple years ago, got to the point where I was actually planning my demise. And um, what a lot of people don't realize about suicide is the idea is you don't want to die, you want the suffering to stop, you want the pain to quit. 
your approach was almost the reverse. It was a preemptive strike. You didn't want it to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I wasn't actually. I actually was very happy with my life. I just was. I wasn't depressed. Or, I mean, I can. I can't like relate to other people that are suffering from depression, which I, you know, I can't. I don't even claim to understand it. But um, I wasn't suffering from that. I was just really. Like, the, the thing is that for me, hell was really just real. It was a real concept, and I didn't understand why so many people around me that claimed to be Muslim didn't take it more seriously. Like most of the most of the people I knew in Iran didn't pray, they drink alcohol, they had sex before marriage. And when I asked them, well, aren't you worried about going to hell? They were like, oh, I don't think God cares. And they're like, are you sure? Like, don't you want to be? Like, <laughs> most people seem to be more uh, worried about their grades or about their career. And they're like, you could burn forever and you're not even considering trying to do something to avoid it. Like nobody seemed to care that much. I, I, as a kid, I found that very strange. <laughs> uh, thanks for your presentation, Armin. Um, so I actually thought of two questions there while you were chatting. So you had mentioned about um, your parents becoming atheists. And my thought was, um, did you experience a strained relationship with them um, prior to their conversion? And then from your own personal story, in your own conversion story, was there one moment, and uh, what was that moment, where you, you flipped, where you thought, this is, the, this is the one thing that did it for me? Okay. Um, well, my, you know, I, I talked to a lot of ex-Muslims, and um, my parents are, were a little bit different than most of the stories that I hear. Um, you know, my parents were, even when they were Muslim, they were liberal. And when I became very religious, they were really annoyed with me because I, <laughs> because I was trying to get them to pray. I was trying to get them to fast. I was trying to, you know, get them out of hell. And they like, they have like, yeah, there's this nut job in their house. Um, but so when I became an atheist, they were like, ah, oh, thank God. <laughs> so, but eventually they started getting even more worried when they realized that I'm telling my friends and my in school and university and they, they were worried about my uh, you know, safety. So eventually when I told them that I want to leave the country, they were like, yes, get out of here. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, but most, you know, a lot of ex-Muslims that I hear, they get a lot of negative reaction. I mean, their, their family abandoned them, they feel, um, uh, you know, it's, you get a lot of, I hear a lot of heartbreaking messages. Your other question was? Uh, your uh, personal experience and uh, that moment that you flipped with, if there was one. Just one more question after this, and then we'll have to, to move on with the next um, For me, I, I mean, I, I, it was a, in a gradual uh, switch, but I remember crying and praying to God that I'm losing uh, my faith in him and that um, I'm looking for him, um, and he just should give me a sign. I'm looking for evidence. I'm looking for any proof. And if he's there, I don't want to go to hell. And I feel like I, I, even before I was an atheist, I could see that I'm heading that way. So I, I beg God to show me any sign if he wants to avoid me becoming an atheist. And um, he didn't. So, <laughs> so eventually I was an atheist. Uh, th thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so, as uh, as atheists and secularists in Canada, we don't have a lot of uh, consequences necessarily to being open about being atheist and secular and stuff. Not a lot of social consequences, not a lot of personal consequences, unless you come from a, uh, you know, if you're Amish or if you're a Mormon or if you're Jehovah's Witness, there are some. Um, but I was reminded during your uh, presentation about uh, all the... Um, the atheist bloggers in uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh yeah. which is uh, atrocious. Like, we talk about consequences. These folks were doxxed. I, I can't remember how many, something like 85. And Eight. Uh, like, their information was Oh, yes, online. yes, yes. Okay. 
you know, that, and um, by the government. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if you've. Uh, obviously, you probably have. I don't know if anybody else has seen the response from the most recent. Um, yes. The, the response from the police. Yes, they were like, yeah, it's bad that they're clean bloggers, but stop criticizing Islam. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it seems like this is a very real, uh, you know, imminent threat to people like us there. Um, what, uh, what sort of outreach are you guys, is there anything that, you know, people like us can do to assist? I don't know if there's... Yeah, you could talk, to, you know, find those bloggers and talk to them. And they would actually love to talk to you. And they, uh, if you... Uh, they would like you to share their stories. They would like you to write about their stories. They would like you to interview them and put them on YouTube. They would like you to, um, you know, uh, you know, and you know. Actually, when you say like we don't have that many consequences here, I feel like the whole point of sharing these stories is to feel like less. I'm in Vancouver and they're over there. Like feel more like we're on planet Earth all together. So they are kind of right next to us. You know, as if, you know, it's, it doesn't matter that they're far away. We're, you know, it, it, it's irrelevant that we're in Vancouver and there's low consequences here. They're our fellow human beings, right? They're, they might as well be just right next to us. Um, but, I mean, to get more people to care, eventually I think will lead to something bigger. So I think right now the focus should be to, you know, these bloggers, they, it, doesn't get, it doesn't get that much media coverage at all. I mean, why? Because the news media, they know that the people don't care. So the first step is to get more people to care. You know? And when it, more people care, more, it will get more real coverage. And when it gets more real coverage, politicians start caring as well. You know? So I think the first step is to just get more people to care. Thank you.